Hello, this is Phoenix. And this is Aria. And we're sat by a river. It's very calm again. There's some boats nearby. We can see a city in the distance. On the other side of the river, we can see forest. And there's also an old fairground, and I can just see the Ferris wheel poking out from the top of the trees. We're recording this because we wanted to talk to you about a book that's helped us in our healing journey. This book is called PTSD Time to Heal and it's by a being called Cathy O'Brien. Some of you might have heard of Cathy O'Brien before, and that's because she's been very outspoken. I guess my first thought was this book seems very short, but actually I find a lot of these longer books just sort of pad out a lot of the material and don't get to the point, but this yeah. book's very succinct. Cathy O'Brien is a survivor herself. I think it's very hopeful to hear from someone who's done the journey themselves and has healed from it. Okay, so from this book, Cathy O'Brien's PTSD Time to Heal. When we first began speaking out, mind control and PTSD were unheard of in the general public domain. Now it has increasingly become common knowledge due to the vast numbers of our military veterans suffering from PTSD. The Veterans Administration has finally, 25 years later, acknowledged the reality of this emotionally debilitating affliction. It has been a long journey for us as US government whistleblowers and a much more difficult one for the numerous veterans seeking to reclaim control over their minds and lives. With our veterans suiciding at a rate of 22 per day as of this writing, we cannot wait another 25 years for release of this otherwise classified healing information. Veterans or other victims of mind control are dying because of suicide all the time because it's so devastating the effects of what they do. That was just a great introduction to say how important it is that this work is being done and I think especially by someone who is a survivor of this abuse because in my experience I've found therapists to be useless really. Quite frankly I much prefer these people talking from their own experience and that's why me and Phoenix wanted to do this series of book reviews really to, to show the fantastic books out there that really do help people heal that have helped me that have helped phoenix that actually work therapy and the medical system has been a disaster for me and very dangerous that's why we'd like to share this information with you because it's actually helpful you could even extend this definition of veteran to cover most children on this planet although we strictly mean veteran defined as someone who's experienced combat in a named war for example, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. We won't at this point go into the machinations that were required in order to drive people into these conflicts, these false, fake conflicts. But anyway, that aside, if you look at the average childhood on Earth, many people's childhoods on Earth, you will find that they have been in a war. Childhood, for many people on this planet, is a war because you're subjected to all of the anger and bitterness that so many adults feel about being subjugated in their everyday lives by these abusive, angry people. And often people, rather than confronting authority in their own lives and standing up to abusers like politicians, people who claim that they run the school system of our Earth. Rather than standing up to those people, people often turn their anger against the most vulnerable people on the planet, and that's often children. So I think when Cathy O'Brien says veterans, for me, that includes most children. It doesn't simply restrict itself to those who assembled a rifle and were packed off to Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. These wars of trauma that have done nothing except to maintain the elite's grip over us. Returning to the book, here's another paragraph that Arya has highlighted. Mind control programming or dissociation is like a well-worn rut or groove in the brain. Imagine rivers of thought so entrenched that thinking free of that pathway is akin to pushing the river to a new direction. It requires mental deliberateness and conscious determination. The most effective way to reach that mental deliberateness and conscious determination is to re-establish free thought. Reopen neuron pathways that have closed due to the brain's response to trauma too horrible to comprehend. Remember, hypnotists are only as good as their education and integrity. You do not need someone outside yourself leading you within. This can be done through writing out memory. The very act of moving a pen uses the logic function of the brain, whereby shifting your emotionally incomprehensible trauma over to logic, where it can be consciously dealt with. You already survived it once, and remembering it and writing it out will only free you from it. It's so true what Kathy is saying. The mind control creates these kind of well-worn paths in your mind through the programming. And once you begin this process of allowing memories to come back, writing them out, like Kathy said, you start to open up your brain to ways that you've been affected by the trauma. Aria, you use illustration as well as writing to process your traumatic Mm. experiences. Yes, yeah, that's that's an important point as well. I mean, I also write out memories because I feel 
that does have a certain use in that it just feels good to have something off your mind and on the paper then it's outside of you drawing and art has helped me fully process the memories because I find visual arts the best it allows me to transform the memory so I try and take what happened to me it's almost like a spiritual process as energy or maybe spiritual instinct there and I feel like it's trying to transform the memory so it's not just stuck in this unbearable experience it's transforming it into something positive something where there's light and there's love and not just destruction because you were there too and you're not those things so that's what I find the most powerful to truly heal from it I find transforming the experience through art very very helpful maybe I can use a real life example one of the most difficult challenging memories that came up was actually very much the feeling memory of what happened so for me, as a child, it felt like my soul was being ripped away from my body. What I consider rape to be is soul murder. That's what it felt like as a child. And I vividly remembered this feeling of my soul, which was in the form of a hummingbird, trying to be ripped away from my body during this experience. But as a child, I remember desperately calling to myself to my soul and saying please stay with me please stay with me don't leave me don't leave me and I begged my soul to stay and it did stay despite this massive trauma and it was so hard to hold on to that part of myself in the artwork I tried to express this struggle that I had and so I did a massive drawing on my wall and I drew a big circle because circle is infinity the whole and then I drew the darkness but I didn't want to draw the darkness everywhere I wanted to transform this experience my soul had stayed with me and hummingbirds their wings flap in the shape of infinity so I drew hummingbirds in the pattern of infinity and inside the infinity I put the darkness so I felt like this was transforming the memory because during that experience it felt like the darkness was everywhere and it was almost taking hold of me but I managed to hold on and that's an amazing triumph and I wanted to express that the darkness didn't win the light did and my soul stayed and so that's the kind of transformation of what happened okay so to return to Kathy O'Brien's book PTSD time to heal here's another paragraph um, you'll need some context here that is that Mark who is described in this section we'll read helped her heal from the abuse she experienced as a child so when she talks about Mark here she's talking about the I guess the first person she met in her life who felt like he had a level of integrity and warmth that she could trust so here's the passage from the book when Mark first rescued my daughter and me from our mind-controlled existence I could not think to trust that we were safe. With no capacity for free thought, my senses had heightened much the way a blind person develops acute hearing. I sensed Mark could be trusted because his pets naturally showed me the way. People who abuse children usually abuse animals, and I had never encountered someone like Mark whose animals displayed trust. Every pet Mark had, whether it was his fox, raccoons or dogs, all eagerly and affectionately greeted him and lovingly stayed at his side. I really like this passage because I felt like that's so true. I feel like you can actually get quite a sense, a sense of a person for how animals and children react. Although children is a bit more difficult because sometimes if they're in an abusive family, they're forced to like people they actually hate. But you know, an untraumatized animal, it has absolute access to the intuition. So they're very good guides in a way at knowing who to trust. And most of the people who, who animals respond to well, who are, want to be close to the animal, where the animal has no fear. They're good people. Animals have that sense of intuition. I also feel like there are some exceptions to that rule. That is that obviously, as Aria said, some children through abuse can be trained to appear superficially affectionate towards their abusers. Yeah. And the same thing, dogs or other animals who are abused mm. can appear superficially yeah. connected to their mm. abusers. This can only be sustained for a short amount of time. You will see through the cracks. So I guess this answers a question which many survivors might have, and that is, I've been abused by so many people, and I've been programmed, in a sense, to return again and again to people who are abusive because I'm unconsciously drawn to them because they feel familiar or of the family 
How do I escape? What signs do I look for that will allow me to identify someone who might be able to support me as I heal? And I think one of those signs is certainly how do animals and children respond to this person and also look for many separate incidents with different different beings interacting with this being. Also, I think a good indicator, although obviously because of the, the current hoax, many people aren't dining out, but it's also interesting to watch how people treat people they don't have to be nice to. For example, look at how people treat the waiting staff. How does this person treat these people? How does the person treat a cashier? How do they treat a parking attendant? How do these people who might be able to very cleverly put on a disguise in front of you and in front of other people who they want to impress? How do they treat people who they don't have to impress? How do they treat people who they don't have to be nice to? And I think these can give someone a good indication of whether this person's a good person to be around. So to return to Cathy O'Brien's book, here is another passage that Aria felt was interesting. Cathy O'Brien writes, When people who have been traumatised and ignored abuse memories, intrusive flashes increase and become more pervasive in an effort to gain attention. If these alarm systems are still ignored, the body often amplifies the need through various illnesses, many of which cannot be medically identified or diagnosed. Digestive issues usually surface first, with various phantom aches and pains, colds and flus becoming routine. Mm. Colds and flus becoming routine. Listen to your body before the alarm reaches this crescendo. Make note of flashes and write out your memory. It's interesting. Look, I haven't read... I'm just going to uh, say something quickly here. I haven't read this book for a while, but I'm just... This is very prescient, isn't it? Could you interpret the current state of the world as a massive hypochondriac fit by the global population provoked by the media? And a lot of these things that are being attributed to some mystery virus are probably a lot of people... So, yeah, a lot of psychosomatic illnesses arising as a result of people having been so abused on this planet. So it's interesting when Kathy writes... Digestive issues usually surface first, with phantom aches and pains, colds and flus becoming routine. It's interesting. <laughs> I mean, that would be my diagnosis. I mean, aside from the fact that I mean the whole thing's being provoked by the media, but also this this idea of some strange virus out there coming to get us. It's very much the disease model of the abuser that you're not ill because you've been hurt. You're ill because something mysterious and invisible is attacking you. That's invisible. How convenient that the cause <laughs> the cause of your illness is invisible. It's not your it's your not. father or grandfather or mother. It's not someone in your family system who's mm -hmm. abusing you or someone in the culture or politician. Mm. Absurd. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I, I feel like we really need to move away from this, yeah. this whole flu thing. I feel like just talking about <laughs> it endorses it with some sort of validity when it has none. No. I've definitely experienced this like I used to have so many aches and pains psychosomatic stuff at one point I went to a doctor thinking I had sinusitis you know this was all before I'd really started the healing though because now since healing I've been intense healing still in intense healing I, I haven't been ill and to be honest this supposed virus I have absolutely no fear of this because I haven't been ill in in ages I don't get colds because I'm actually at the point now where I'm so receptive to what my body is telling me if I feel like my body's tense I use relaxation methods I do some yoga I take a bath and normally in a couple of days I feel better again so I don't need to get ill because I'm dealing I think all the underlying cause of most illness is stress which has its origins in the past so if you basically if you deal with the stress and if you deal with the memories that is causing the stress then eventually you won't need to get ill yeah the western disease mm. model is as you probably know from your own experiences out there in the world it's very confusing isn't it the logo of these alleged doctors is a stick and a snake I mean, that's what they painted on the side of a lot of their hospitals and vans. The idea that something outside, invisible, mysterious is coming to get you very much distracts people from the physical, tangible reality of who is out to get you, really. And that's many of these people who claim that their family or that they're your political allies or that claim that they're your government or mm. claim that they have some authority over you a lot of these people very much like it that you think there's some mysterious thing out there trying yeah. to get you because it mean, stops you concentrating on the material thing that's here it, and it, is getting you exactly it's, it's very convenient isn't it let's focus let's focus on this invisible reality and also what a great way to, for them to make money you know they love making money through drugs and personally I will in the next few months stop supporting the medical system because I find it absolutely flawed, very destructive system. 
and personally I have my own ways of not becoming sick. The only reason that I would ever ever enter into that system is if I broke a limb or something external actually happened to me but I think the rest of it is totally psychological. So to return to the book here's another paragraph. Wisely avoid contact with abusers. Rather than confront my father like archaic counselling methods suggest I chose to stay away from him. No letters or text, no phone calls, and certainly no contact. This allowed for my brain to continue its healing path and made it much easier to stay lifted from entrenched pathways and ruts. I feel this is absolutely essential. So for me, it was totally instinctive then to cut contact. I was so disgusted and so horrified and so angry that the only natural reaction was to cut contact with them. Why would I want to be around with people who were so harmful to me? That's a really important part of the process. And I mean, I've struggled with it sometimes in the past because I've trusted a lot of people that have then turned out to be abusive. As soon as you get an indication that someone is abusive and listen to your friends, listen to the people, the good people that you trust. You know, I've made this mistake many times where I didn't, I was, I was still so blind to the fact that if you've been through serious trauma, you unfortunately will probably be attracted to having friendships with people that are very dangerous because you just cannot see their danger. Even if you have one person that you trust, listen to them if they tell you that they're worried about this person or really look out for signs of people being abusive in your immediate environment because unfortunately there is this pattern of repetition that you experience with with your family with an abuser and so you unconsciously seek out people that have the same characteristics as these people because there's this sort of small child hope in you that it will be different this time that maybe these people are a bit different you can change them but unfortunately that is a total illusion you can't change these people much better to just be aware and to really cut these people straight out of your life as soon as you see it hopefully even before that point yeah most tragically a lot of people end up partnering with people who very closely mimic their abusers especially if the abuser was in the immediate family father or mother there is an unconscious compulsion to repeat and that does often manifest in people choosing for their most intimate partners people who resemble very closely those people who hurt them in the past and shared many of the characteristics so it's quite a difficult process because for many people it will require saying okay actually i've created a situation unconsciously where all the people or almost all the people who are orbiting me are orbiting me because i was unconscious of being abused and because they're in a sense feeding off my unconsciousness my unawareness and so, yeah, it, it can be a difficult awakening. When she talks about the archaic counselling concept of negotiating, in, in a sense, with the abuser, the idea that you could somehow reconcile with parents or reconcile with an abusive father or mother, this is a very idealistic perspective. I don't doubt that in a very, very tiny number of cases where the parent or the abuser has taken serious steps to heal themselves, that it might be possible. However, I think it's so unlikely, through my experience, seeing other survivors trying to heal from their family systems, I've got to the point where I think the likelihood of the family healing alongside you is so tiny that in your effort to make that a reality, you're more often going to lapse into self-abuse. And I feel like for most people, it's a much better idea to let the abusive family go, let them go, and build something else because the efforts and contortions that you might make to try and save people who you know through your experiences are wounded and confused enough that they would abuse a child you cannot rescue these people through words alone you cannot rescue them through your love you cannot it's a waste of time you should take that energy and focus it on yourself I totally agree with Phoenix here and I mean I've also had this sometimes I get this sense of you know oh I just want to be forgiving and sort of reconcile with with these people that have done these horrible things and it's like no it's a complete fabrication I think some things are so terrible that actually they they should not be forgiven I don't forgive my abusers right now I feel like I do not forgive these people often they make absolutely no attempt to heal to even account for what they've done I mean you see abusers like this look at Jeffrey Epstein or Prince Andrew. Survivors have come forward and said, this person has done this and this. And even at this point where it's so clear what they've done, 
they will take no level of responsibility they will try and hide they will try and deny on the topic of forgiveness i think if you are told you need to forgive or okay this sounds like a very honorable thing doesn't it oh the high moral road isn't it to forgive but what does it actually mean to forgive and who is telling you to forgive the people who push the forgiveness line the strongest and look i'm gonna there are obviously clear exceptions i don't think that everyone who is religious is abusive far from it however there are certain members of these alleged religious groups which are quite the opposite sometimes who will tell someone forgive this must have happened so many times in our culture someone from a family where a child is being abused goes to a priest and says what can we do my husband is abusing the children what can i do he's sexually abusing the children and the priest says look forgive him that scenario there is the very epicenter of why so much abuse occurs in our society. It's a lot of people who have the naive assumption that forgiveness means do nothing, mm. means do nothing. It means don't take any action. For me, forgiveness is not a useful concept. What is useful for me is the concept of love. And I apply that to the abuser in this way. If I was abusing children, if I was an abusive father abusing a daughter, and I was able to put myself temporarily in the perspective of a higher state of consciousness, and I was able to say, what is the most loving thing that someone could do to me as in mm. this concept of do unto others as you would have them do unto you if i was a father abusing a child i would want someone to stop me mm. and i would want them to use whatever means necessary to stop me mm. and that would be love to me yes. if the concept of do unto others as you would have them to do unto you applies to abusers people who are abusing children then it makes a lot of sense to me that the most loving course of action is to do whatever is necessary to stop that. Not to say, oh, just ignore it, which is what this concept of forgiveness often seems to imply. If you know someone's abusing a child or if someone comes to you and says that they know someone who's abusing a child, if you're in that situation and you want to love that abuser, if you want to love that abuser, then stop them. Then say as loudly as you can to everyone that you know what is happening and stop that person by whatever means necessary. That is love. I totally agree. I also believe in that concept of love and put yourself in that other person's shoes and I don't agree with wrathful like revenge wish that I don't agree with that that's not what I would want for an abuser I know it would hurt me to see someone else in pain even an abuser I couldn't do that to someone because I, I feel you know I would feel that emotion and I could not do that I think the best thing is exactly as Phoenix said is you want them to stop the most helpful thing would be for them to go through some process of healing that process this trauma and accept what they've done so here's mm. another paragraph from Kathy O'Brien's book cannabis usage is not conducive to mind control or keeping secrets which is why it is strictly forbidden and its use reprimanded in the military as it was throughout my victimization in MK Ultra. It is said the Vietnam War was lost due to cannabis usage, as it was intended by Vietnamese war captains who knew of its effects in disrupting military point-and-shoot programming. Medical cannabis can bring you to a peaceful, non-violent now that helps the past from intruding on the present. It is a therapeutically safe way to balance brain work of writing out memory with reassociating with the present in an uplifting way. Because medical cannabis keeps you in the now, it is not beneficial while writing out memory. Do expect, however, to be making note of memory flashes that naturally surface due to the herb's relaxation and reputed expansion of thought. Keep a notebook with you at all times. Make notes of flashes to write out in full after a good night's sleep with a clear mind. I feel like cannabis can be a great companion to helping deal with the state of anxiety that seems to accompany the trauma of abuse. To be honest, cannabis hasn't been the main tool in my healing, but I do see how it's helped many others and it has helped me from time to time. But I think I wanted to clarify exactly what is meant by, I mean, Kathy O'Brien does say medical cannabis. So, I mean, that would have been cannabis that was grown under certain conditions to a certain quality. I would say the thing to be careful of is that there is some stuff out there broadly called cannabis, which is extremely strong hybrids and very strong strains that have been specifically designed to get people as stoned as possible. This is not a useful tool in my experience for healing. However, what you could try if you're open-minded and mm. you're interested in experimenting with this path of healing is you could grow your own which is in itself a very therapeutic experience mm. it's very easy if you live in a reasonably sunny climate to grow one small plant and it's a very healing experience in itself to watch that little plant grow which brings me on to another broader point and that is we have been given the impression by that very same political structure that abused us that there is something strange or unusual about using psychedelic plants like cannabis However, it's not strange and unusual. 
Our culture is strange and unusual in that it doesn't use psychedelics. It's strange and unusual that we don't have ceremonies within our communities in which we engage with each other and nature through the careful, supported use of psychedelics. That is what's unusual about our society. If you look at South American cultures that are much older than the cultures that we refer to when we think about history, for thousands and thousands of years they've used sacraments like ayahuasca, mushrooms and others to heal and grow. However, you may, as a listener, have been subjected to years and years, if not decades, of propaganda that has turned you against these healing plants and medicines. What I invite you to do is to consider, if I now acknowledge that the government, the power systems that I lived under, sustained themselves through abuse, rape, murder, various horrors, you can look through the history books of what the British Empire has been up to, if this same regime has emphatically and repeatedly turned me against these natural healing substances, could it be because they work? Could it be because they work? They don't seem to have turned you against the substances which harm you definitively, alcohol, tobacco. They profit and promote these substances, and yet they tell you that something like cannabis, which is relatively harmless, if it's used in respectful quantities in the right way, this has been demonized. This is the very tricky path to tread. Your healing requires that you not only tread a path towards yourself, but that you, in the process, disregard all of the lies and all of the machinations and deceptions that have been placed in your path by these authoritarian systems to divide you from yourself. And so the process of healing is not simply one of coming back to yourself, but also of taking off the cloaks, many, many cloaks of your social conditioning. And each cloak that you take off brings you closer to yourself. I found, personally, that I was massively conditioned against the use of any of these medicines as a means to heal. I was resolutely against them, but it was only when I abandoned those teachings or that propaganda of the culture that hurt me that I began to find that there was a way to heal. And I feel like Kathy, it's interesting, Kathy has often made the point that one of the most reliable ways to disrupt trauma-based mind control is through the use of cannabis. It wasn't a decision that I sort of made in a very sort of resolute, conscious way, but I do find myself slowly becoming a peaceful advocate for some of these plants, for some of these healing roots that don't involve going into a little glass and brick building with a snake and a stick painted on the outside and going to see someone who calls themselves a doctor. I just want to clarify, I'm, I think there are many people within the medical system who have sort of crept in there to try and change it from within, so I don't begrudge every single doctor, but I think as a broad, as a broad concept, there's something much more powerful than the medical community can currently offer you to heal. Mm. I find it very optimistic what Kathy's saying here and I must say I haven't personally tried this method as much as I would like. I'm hoping to very soon. I think one thing that, that is maybe good to mention is that actually these abusers that tortured me in the past, they are so manipulative in what they're doing that they sometimes foresee that a survivor of abuse might in the future use potentially cannabis or, or other psychedelics as ways to heal from their trauma and they intentionally use for example cannabis was used in one of my ritual abuses it, it was smoked in the room so whenever I try and use this to relax or to heal I would be greeted with the horrible trauma of this torture I still feel there's value in these medicines and I'm determined to get through it I just feel like it might be a process of time where I have to process the this trauma where the cannabis was smoked during it yeah that's an interesting point aria raised the, that is a big challenge i think for many survivors especially survivors of ritual abuse that as aria said you may find that the very substances that can heal you were used as part of your abuse and they often have done that i think in recent years because maybe they've woken up to the fact some people are using psychedelics to wake up and so they will use psychedelics within the trauma experience itself in order to give you a natural aversion to them i've definitely met survivors who would recoil at the smell of cannabis smoke and wouldn't be able to define quite why it was they felt so drawn away from it. I mean, of course, some of you might think, well, of course they're drawn away from it. It's a horrible evil drug. But I think others might realize, well, actually, there's no reason to naturally be averse to that smell. I don't believe. I think it's like a naturally occurring substance. So I do feel like some of this aversion is often conditioned, not only from the culture, but sometimes from the abuse. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you really are unpicking decades of conditioning through the television and, and radio and government propaganda but you're also unpicking potentially experiences that you had in the past around these substances that weren't healthy or healing because it's not just the substance that heals you it's the context that it's used within okay so another section from the book mark taught me at the onset of my healing process to voice no negatives without a solution 
So she's written soul solution like soul, like a human soul, like the ineffable center of your being. Think on that a moment and take in the depth of meaning, thinking of a solution to a brain exercise in itself. It is far easier to complain than to think in terms of a solution. Thinking of a solution helped reroute my brain paths. It also taught me to choose my thoughts rather than go down the rabbit hole of negativity. I really like this because I think it's so easy when you've been through such difficult things to almost lose hope and really struggle with just how evil some things in the world are. But I really like this approach and it's helping me a lot at the moment. I've actually stuck up some little stickers around my apartment with some positive, helpful phrases like voice no negatives without a solution. Everything in the universe wants you to heal. You want to heal. Your deepest self wants to heal. And once you've managed to do that, and even while you're in the process of it, you want to help others heal. You want to help the world heal. So I think that's a really great approach, and I, I'm trying to do that more in my life. If there's something that I don't like or there's something that's going wrong, I try and think of a solution or something positive that you can do to, to help change things. Change is possible. If you can see it in your own life, then you can see it happening outside of you as well. So this is another section from the book. This chapter is called Break Routine, and here's a paragraph from this chapter. If you usually relax by dissociating into video games, take a walk instead. Many video games are patterned after military training to desensitize, as evidenced by their effect on society. Walking outdoors in nature opens the mind and can be healing on many levels. Walking uses both sides of the brain at once, which is very helpful to the healing process. Take a notebook with you, always keep a notebook within reach i just wanted to quickly say something about that and that is that i i'm not resolutely on one side or the other of this violent video games debate as in i feel like probably on balance video games have done a lot to help our societies because i think a lot of kids who might otherwise go out and act out their violence on the streets or on other children after having been abused now can go into a video game and sort of shoot virtual soldiers however i do agree with kathy in that, that it does have a desensitizing effect and i don't know what the long-term consequences of, of that level of violence but i do see how on the sort of a, an immediate level the kid who's angry as I was as a kid and I did play a lot of video games instead of going and acting out this abuse or expressing that anger in a dangerous way they can go into the world of video games and express the anger through that so I'm not quite as definitive on video games having a purely negative effect on society I, I'm not I'm not on board with that but I, I broadly agree with what she's saying it, that it is a form of dissociation if you're trying to reach a higher state of consciousness and you are aware that one means by which you dissociate from your environment and your stress is to play a video game, then you might consider going for a walk instead because then you will be confronted most likely with the underlying reasons for the anger or the reasons you feel like you need to detach. And I think that conversation with yourself is the healing conversation. Mm. It can take other forms. It could take being on the internet or watching series and things like this. I mean, I, I've definitely had this as well where, you know, and it's not a problem to watch series. It's just when you're doing it to avoid feelings, you know. So I find going into nature one of the best things you can do because it has a sort of automatic calming effect. I'm going to read another short excerpt from the book, PTSD Times Hill, Kathy O'Brien. This chapter is called Brain Games and... Here's a paragraph from the chapter. Clean house. Organising your house helps organise your thoughts on the deepest of levels. This is especially helpful when you're experiencing a perceptual straddling of dimensions between past and present, whereby it seems you're walking into walls and or dropping things. Reassociate with your physical being through cleaning your house, taking a walk and exercising your brain. Sorting my apartment, sorting my room has been a really useful way to gauge my own mental state. Me and Phoenix have been going through this big shift, focusing on minimalism and just getting rid of anything that's unnecessary that doesn't align with your own values. And I found that it's been really hard for me to get rid of some items of clothing because it attaches to a whole identity even to sort of transition away from this into my true self. Making this kind of external change can actually have a really reinforcing effect on internal change so the internal realization has to come first really because otherwise it's so hard to shift these habits if you just say okay right i'm just going to get rid of this stuff it might creep back in in another way you have to change your mind to change the external reality but 
this is a really helpful process just really becoming so much more aware of what you're doing in every aspect of your life and I think your living situation the objects that you choose to have around you are all reflections of your mental state so this can be really helpful and really liberating to create a nice calm happy peaceful place for you to rest and be safe a famous writer I'm not sure who it was let's say F Scott Fitzgerald or that wasn't someone of that caliber Fitzgerald said, although he didn't, someone else did, have nothing in your house that is not beautiful or necessary. And I feel like if you go through your belongings and you use that as a barometer, you might find that as you discover things in your house that are neither beautiful or necessary, the question then becomes, why are these things here? Often the answer I've found to that question is because they remind me of the past and often not a particularly positive past. You might find that you've collected a whole series of trinkets that aren't actually objects close to your heart, but actually objects that unconsciously remind you of traumatic episodes. It's not unusual to sort of have been this unconscious collector of almost memento mori, reminders of death, each small death that you experienced at the hands of an abuser. There's no point throwing things out if you feel like it's something you're obligated to do. It has to be something you do very consciously. What does this object represent to me? Why do I keep it? Do I need it anymore? And in letting go of it, can I let go of the feelings and emotions connected with the experience that the object represents? Yeah. Be super aware of things that you've unconsciously kept. For example, I had images of the crown scattered around my apartment, totally unconscious. You know, I had a hairbrush which somehow had the image of the crown on it. That's you know, the British crown. The, the, British. the British so-called royal family actually paedophile ring, the British paedophile ring. Yeah. As I became more aware of, of who the royal family actually were and what they represented, I was like, actually, why do I have this in quite a few sort of unexpected places in my apartment? So I got rid of all this stuff. Or, for example, maybe if you've also experienced abuse by the Freemasons, you might have checkered stuff. It might be very subtle, but becoming more sensitized to these subtle triggers is very important because then you can stop re-triggering yourself when you see these objects. That absolutely doesn't mean go to Ikea, never go to Ikea again. What it means is it subtract things, I think, mostly from mm -hmm. your space, subtract them. We, at this point, we don't need to add anything. Almost, almost without fail, and I'm not saying like launched into some sort of puritanical Buddha-like state, but what I'm saying is the resolution to your inner world, if you want it to be reflected in the outer world, is most likely to remove things from yeah. your spaces not yeah. to add anything because this is the mistake people sometimes make I'm gonna make a new start so I'll chuck out all the old furniture and I'll buy all new furniture that is the most fundamental mistake don't do that instead really consider why are the things in my space here yeah. and do I need them what do they mean and I found with uh, removing things I thought oh it's gonna be a big lack but that was also an interesting thing to note was that actually my decisions with objects in my particularly with clothes you know I thought oh if I get rid of all this stuff I'll I won't have anything to wear or there'll be this big lack and actually it was reflected in my choice of friendships as well I was taking in a lot of people as friends that weren't exactly these sort of good people that I should be around and since reducing my number of friends as well to really true authentic loving people I have very few friends now which was quite a difficult process but much better to have few good friends than lots of destructive people that was reflected in my clothing as well. There's, a, there's another boat approaching the dock. Sort of various sounds you probably heard throughout this podcast. What's that strange sound you probably thought? Well, okay, that's past. So I'll just finish by reading one last part of the book. And this is from the final chapter. And it's just one sentence. And the sentence is, healing is the best revenge. Being well and overcoming the life that you never chose, that other people have totally designed what they want for you from your life so healing and becoming free and liberated from the past and being totally free from their programming what they did the effects of it is definitely the best revenge famous writer i forget who let's say scott fitzgerald someone of that caliber said if you seek revenge dig two graves and I feel that's true. Although there's a phase, and I think you, you can go through it and respect it as a phase. There is a phase where you think, well, I'd really like to get those people. You know, I still have it sometimes these days. I really think, oh, I'd really like to get that Bill Gates. But I mean, if you, if you leave these people alone and, and sort of isolate them, Bill Gates, Bill Clinton, I mean, I mean, who are these people without the majesty that you've given them in your mind as a result of all the weird social program you've been subjected to? The abuser 
whether that's a family member or whether we talk about the larger abusers in society, people like the British paedophile family and Bill Gates and, and Bill Clinton and other abusers around the planet, sure, I can appreciate and like partly behind the idea of, yeah, let's put them all on Epstein's Island and surround the thing with sharks. I mean, obviously, these ideas, they do in some ways appeal. But on the other hand, I have better ways to occupy my time. I cycle, I draw, I make music, I sing, I dance. I do everything that I know. I mean, obviously, I don't bear this in mind at the time because they're far from my thoughts. But in a way, I'm doing everything they would probably hate me doing. I think some of these abusers, like Bill Gates, probably likes the idea that you want to go and kill him. He probably likes that idea, you know, because it makes him feel important and like he's provoking anger in you. I've just got no interest in this. I'd rather go and play the drums or swim. These are the things I'd prefer to do than to go and hunt these people down. I think they are of no interest anymore. And I think to many of you, they're of no interest anymore. I think our fascination with these odd demonic characters in their thrones has waned. And I think the, their gaudy velvet curtains are fading. The light is out for the British Empire. The sun has finally set on the British Empire. And I, for one, am bathing in that sunset <laughs> me too okay thank you for listening if you have any questions about the content that we talked about you can leave some comments here on BitChute in, in Discus no doubt it's, it'll turn into total chaos because it's completely unmoderated but there you go good luck